Well, good morning and welcome to uh, our service this morning. I nearly said welcome to St. Mark's, you know, it's such a, it's such a shame thinking of last week and uh, the seats being uh, full, uh, all of them are two metres apart and uh, it seemed very strange to have had to do this and uh, we hope that uh, this will not be for too long but, uh, as uh, the vaccine is uh, rolled out and uh, as people get a little bit more confidence that uh, that things are okay and that they can come they can come out. So welcome this morning to our service, and I hope that uh, you are able to hear us properly. Please just message on the uh, Facebook stream that the sound is coming through okay. That would be really helpful, and uh, we will make adjustments uh, accordingly. So the 17th of January 2021, uh, we will be sending out our notice sheets as normal. They are of course available on our website under the tab uh, Weekly Notices and you can download them there. Please do take a look at, uh, at the notices and of course it's saying, uh, we're saying we're still here, we're still here for you and uh, if you have any needs or anything that uh, you would like help with, whether it's uh, prayer or anything like that, please do be in touch with the leadership team as uh, we seek to serve and uh, help uh, help the church community. Wonderful. Well, uh, I've got a good team here this morning. It's lovely that Matthew's joined me, and uh, we'll be hearing from Simon for our sermon, and I think we'll be doing the readings as well, yes, and uh, yeah, thank you to Greg for the streaming and uh, to Caroline for working at the laptop. So we're hoping the technology is all going to work well for you. Let's just start, shall we, as we have an opening prayer. Father God, we thank you. Thank you that we can set this time aside for you. Thank you for all that you have done and thank you that we know that you, Lord, the creator of everything, are still sovereign over all and that you are working your purposes out in these days. Help us, help us, Lord Jesus, to worship you this morning, to offer you our praise and our thanksgiving the work that you've done in each of our lives through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to uh, listen now uh, to our first song, and uh, the lyrics will come up on the screen, Seek ye first the kingdom of God.
this morning we're going to hear of uh, Jesus' command to Philip and Nathaniel, follow me. And uh, as we do that, and as we hear these words read to us and Simon preached to us, we must remember that we so often fail to hear the commands of our Lord, and so often fail to follow him as we should. So we come now to a time of confession where we recognise those failures and ask for our Lord's forgiveness. So let us hear our Lord's blessing on those who follow him. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are hungry, who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are those who suffer persecution for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So let us confess our many failures to keep this way of truth and light. And we say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. We are heartily sorry and repent of all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Well, the good news is that our Father is always ready to forgive us as soon as we respond to the command of Jesus to repent and follow him. So may the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all of our days. Amen. And now we're going to invite Simon up to bring our reading this morning. Thank you very much indeed, thank you. Well, our first reading has been changed because it matches in our second reading. It's taken from Genesis chapter 28, beginning to read at verse 10. Uh, and uh, it's where Jacob has um, uh, already, as it were, shot himself in the foot by twice deceiving his brother Esau, and so has been sent away for his own safety. When Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran, when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above him stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Our gospel reading is taken, it's the set gospel reading for the day, and it's taken from John chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 43. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. So John 1, 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? 
Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite, in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray now that you pour out your Spirit upon us, help us to hear and receive your word, take it into our hearts and show it forth in our lives, to your glory, honour and praise, and to our blessing and the blessing of those around us. We ask it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, I wonder if you think that uh, this is a rather um, brief passage with not much in it to tell us, but um, in fact uh, it, there's a surprising amount in our passage. Well, it shouldn't surprise any of us really. But uh, I want to start first of all um, with, uh, with this calling of Philip. Jesus has already called um, his first disciples of Andrew and his brothers uh, Simon, who would later be called Peter, James and John, cousins who have all been working together as fishermen. The difference between them and these next two disciples is that those four were definitely followers of John the Baptist, and we're told elsewhere that John the Baptist has uh, pointed out Jesus to them, and that's why they switched their allegiance from John to Jesus, as John himself was telling them to do. But uh, <coughs> Philip and Nathaniel are not actually uh, part of John the Baptist's followers, as far as we can make out. What we do know is that about Philip, we know that uh, his name is one of the most Greek-sounding names amongst all the disciples, and later on in John's Gospel, when the Greeks want to meet with Jesus, they will come and see Philip, first of all, presumably thinking that there's going to be some kind of kinship there. Uh, so that was a significant point in Jesus' ministry when he says, now is the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. Philip plays that key role. It's been suggested that Philip might well be a fisherman, like um, Andrew and Peter and, uh, and James and John. Uh, like them, he comes from the town of Bethsaida, and literally Bethsaida means the fish house or house of fish. So he may have been a fisherman, but then again, he may not have been. We just don't know. Uh, and he may well have had some kind of Greek extraction. Uh, beyond that, we know very little about him, except Here's the extraordinary thing, that here is somebody whom Jesus simply sought out and said, follow me. We don't have any prior knowledge that Philip was himself seeking God, or seeking the, uh, the Messiah, just that Jesus sought him out. So I want you to think for a little moment about the priority of Jesus. See, very often, uh, even when we, we can trace the way that we've been brought to the Lord, uh, we'll either credit ourselves, aren't we really clever to have worked out that we need to follow Jesus, or of course we might credit somebody else. Now God uses people, of course, to actually speak to us and to intervene in our lives, uh, and um, you know, we should all be willing to bless the evangelist or the faithful member of uh, Christ's body who brought to us the gospel message. And yet, always behind all of that, there is always the priority of Jesus. It's the work of his Holy Spirit that makes any evangelism possible. It's the fact that he has already gone before us and prepared the way, rather like John was doing for Jesus, he has prepared the way by the work of his Holy Spirit that actually there is anybody who is willing to follow me. It's always the work of Jesus. The priority of Jesus is something we need to remember. I didn't have any particular person who uh, uh, knew that we were acting as my evangelist when I became a Christian. I was an atheist for the first 19 years of my life, uh, and quite a strong atheist to the extent that uh, the Christian Union knew me uh, and were particularly pleased to know me, I guess, uh, at university. And uh, the, the lady who actually um, 
took me to, I suppose, to the brink of the, uh, to the edge of the door of, of faith, didn't know she'd done it at all. She was amazed when she later on discovered uh, that uh, by her quiet life and prayer, uh, I had been brought to this point. Uh, and uh, nor did the vicar of the communion service have said, if you love the Lord Jesus, you may receive communion. He didn't know what was happening either. He was amazed when he discovered what had happened. So I could have actually said, oh, well, it was just me, but it wasn't. Actually, there was Jesus reaching out, touching my life. But we should take comfort and encouragement from the priority of Jesus. It's his work, and it's only because of his work that we can expect any kind of success in sharing the good news of Jesus. That should humble us and encourage us, so we know he's always going before us, and he already has his target. To Philip, he simply says, follow me, and Philip does. And Philip does something very important. The next thing he does is he goes and tells somebody else. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But when he goes and tells uh, Nathaniel, <coughs> Nathaniel will begin to uh, open up his position in just a moment, but uh, of course Nathaniel is actually reading the scriptures, we know that, uh, and I'll come back to that as well in a second, and because he's somebody who studies the scriptures and is interested in the scriptures, he has in that sense had some preparation. Uh, he's looking for the Messiah, he really is looking. <coughs> and, uh, and notice, therefore, what Philip says to Nathaniel is, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, the law and the prophets. You know that you study the law and the prophets, you are looking for the Messiah, and you're looking in the law and the prophets to find the Messiah. Well, we found him, and he's called Jesus of Nazareth, he's the son of Joseph. And then immediately, what is the response? Not this is really exciting and interesting, but Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Now, some people have reached for this and suggested that Nazareth itself was genuinely a, um, uh, a rather sort of disparate place. There's no evidence of that. This may just simply be local village um, uh, rivalry. So, like we might say, you know, somebody else might say Blackpool. Can anything good come from Blackpool? Well, we'd say yes, lots of good things come from Blackpool. We might go to Fleetwood and say, can anything good come from Fleetwood? Well, We'd pause there, wouldn't we? Because we're in Blackpool. Uh, no, good things could come out of Fleetwood as well. It could just be that local rivalry. Later on, this same kind of prejudice um, will actually, of course, stop. Um, we'll find again in John's Gospel prejudice about the whole region of Galilee when uh, they ask um, uh, they, they ask the, the Pharisee, um, "Can anything good come from Galilee?" And of course they're wrong because at least three of the Old Testament prophets came from Galilee, so they haven't even read their own scriptures. So there was a bit of a looking down on the whole area, and there was this prejudice, and I've called that the prejudice of Jesus, not his prejudice, but the prejudice against him in that sense. And that's the danger for all of us, is that uh, we're not quite ready to hear what God wants to say to us through every situation, because we come with preconceived ideas, we come with a prejudice, we come expecting this person to be able to speak about Jesus, but not this one. This one to respond to Jesus, but not this one. Why do we do that? Why do we actually fail to hear that God speaks through the whole of his creation and all people? Even sometimes, of course, people who don't realise that they are speaking for God. You remember it later on in John's Gospel, it is precisely one of those things that he did not realise, this is Caiaphas the High Priest, he did not realise it, he was prophesying when he said it is necessary for one person to die for the sake of the nation. He didn't know that he was actually speaking God's words at that particular point. Because again, we would need to be aware that God can speak through anyone and anything. And our task, therefore, is to actually be attending to what God is doing, rather than through prejudice and through uh, preconception to wipe it out. So, I would suggest we found two important lessons here. First of all, that Jesus is the key, it's the priority of Jesus, and secondly, that what the blocks him is prejudice. The prejudice, I've called it of Jesus, but it really means against Jesus. Now, the third thing that I want you to see from this passage is that um, uh, what is the very core of the Christian gospel message? Well, it's actually much simpler than sometimes people want to think. Look what uh, happens. So Philip goes and finds Nathaniel. 
and told him, we have found the one that you're looking for. Nazareth, can anything good come out of there? Nathaniel asked. And Philip could have just paused there and went, well, amongst the many things that uh, the, uh, uh, the Nazarites have given us, you know, a bit like um, uh, Monty Python, little things of earth, you know, yes, some of you will pick up on up. However, of course, instead of trying to have an argument with him, instead of trying to win the argument, he simply says, come and see. Now you remember that when Philip just simply responded to follow me, it was the person of Jesus that was captivating. And here, it is still the person of Jesus. Come and see. Put aside your prejudice, come and see. And the come and see is to come and see Jesus. And we know what the outcome is going to be. We know that actually he's bowled over by Jesus' knowledge of him. Jesus has a uh, has an insight into him. He has a perception of him already. You're not surprised because you know that Nathaniel is part of the priority of Jesus. Nathaniel has already been worked on by Jesus' spirit in order to bring him. Nathaniel doesn't know that yet, but the simple words then of Philip, come and see. That is the invitation that every one of us is always wanting to say. Not that I know good things and I know lots of theology or I can live a good life and I do lots of good things. Not even some of these sort of theological arguments about the problem of pain and all the other ones that will never fully resolve. The one thing we want to say every time is come and see. Come and see Jesus. Come and see him for yourself. Come and experience him. Come and share him. Come and see that he loves you. And his priority is already working in your heart and in your life. <coughs> Come and see. And then finally, there's a promise here, the promise of Jesus. And now that's all wrapped up with what with this dialogue between Jesus and Nazareth. So I need to unpack a little bit of that dialogue for you to see the promise. Um, it's, it's clearly summarised at the end. I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and angels of God ascending and descending ascending and descending on the Son of Man, and you will see greater things than that. But let's go back to the beginning of our passage and unpack a little bit. So Nathanael is uh, described by Jesus as, uh, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Now, I said that he was uh, somebody who was clearly studying the, uh, the scriptures, and, um, and that's why Philip used the phrase, the one you're looking for in Moses, and the prophets, we found him. It's just paraphrasing a little bit. Well, the reason we know that is because of this phrase here. Um, rabbis use this under the fig tree metaphor to describe anybody who was actually reading the scriptures. No doubt it originally started by somebody literally sitting under a fig tree uh, and reading the scriptures under the shade of a fig tree. Uh, but it then became just the general synonym for actually reading the scriptures. Under the fig tree. What's he doing? Well, he's under the fig tree. We use synonyms like that in everyday life in the same sort of way. When we don't literally mean that. He may have literally been under a fig tree, or he may not. The point is that the phrase, under the fig tree, meant he was studying scripture. What's the scripture he was studying? Well, we know uh, that uh, Philip has already appealed to the law and the prophets. The law, of course, is the first five books of the Old Testament, the, uh, uh, the books of, of uh, Genesis through to Deuteronomy. So not a surprise at all that we're going to find something from the book of law at the very beginning. How do you know me, Nathaniel asked, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree, literally reading the scriptures before Philip called you. That is the point at which Nathaniel says, well, you know I was reading and studying the scriptures. And there's some kind of suggestion behind this passage which is saying, when Jesus said, uh, I saw you, and uh, Nathaniel is reading so carefully the scriptures, I think there seems to be some kind of echo, you saw me in the scriptures. You saw me, says Jesus, to Nathaniel, effectively, in the scriptures. And I saw you seeing me. <coughs> there has to be some reason why Nathaniel, on that slim piece of information that Jesus knew exactly everything about him, is able to declare two of the most powerful declarations at the very beginning of John's Gospel, from the lips of anybody, 
matching the uh, declaration of Thomas at the other end of John's Gospel when he says, my Lord and my God. Here, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Exactly what the Law and the Prophets keep pointing to, that there is a, the, the, the true Prophet who's going to come. Moses points to, to the true Prophet, a greater Prophet than me, like Moses. Uh, and of course, you know, repeated passages uh, from uh, Samuel onwards will talk about the King who's going to be. So, what we find, of course, here, Nathaniel is beginning to see that in Jesus, all the promises of the Old Testament are being fulfilled. Now, what is Jesus' response to this? Not to say, no, you're wrong, but to accept it. You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. And there's a bit of a play going on here that seems to be suggesting because you can now see, you saw me when I saw you under the fig tree when you were studying the scriptures. You will see greater things than that. Now, what is the greater thing that you're going to see? He then added, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now immediately you'll be taken back to uh, Genesis chapter 28 verses 10 to 17, the first passage that we read because of this, this uh, set passage. This almost uh, certainly therefore has to be what Nathaniel was reading when he was reading the Law and the Prophets. Why else would Jesus suddenly have reached for it? And why therefore, when you have actually said at the very beginning, he is a, a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false, or literally no deceit, no guile, as some have said. <clears throat> well, that links in exactly, of course, to the passage that Jesus then refers to subsequently. Let's go back to that story from Genesis and, and unpack that a tiny bit, and then we'll see what Jesus is saying to Nathaniel. He would have understood because he'd been reading this very passage and seeing Jesus in the Old Testament, and seeing now Jesus before him. So let's go back to Jacob. First of all, we need to remind ourselves, what does Jacob actually mean? The name Jacob means he deceives or supplants. Uh, he was given the name because he was holding on to his brother's heel, uh, which is to grasp, and figuratively that means to supplant or to deceive. And then of course, um, uh, Esau, who was a bit of a worldly guy, <coughs> comes in from uh, hunting, he's famished, and, uh, he's been, and he's being made a pot of red stew, uh, and uh, he says, give me some of that stew before I die. And uh, of course, Jacob says, well, <laughs> you give me your birthright, I'll give you the stew. What's the point of having a birthright? You're going to die. Go on. And of course, actually gives away the most precious thing he had, his birthright. And then the second time, he sees his father. You'll remember the story. This is shortly after this episode, because Esau by now is planning how he's going to kill Jacob. And so um, uh, Jacob has deceived his father by wearing um, the skin of a dead sheep and cooking a delicious food, which was supposed to be the final blessing. And he gets the blessing of the firstborn, even though he's the secondborn. For his own safety, he's sent him away. He has lived up or down to his name. He deceives. He is a deceiver. But of course, later on, after he's gone, gone out to Haran and come back again, now a wealthy man, and made, made up with, it, with uh, Esau, but all of this under the blessing of God, he has a battle with the angel, uh, the angel of the Lord, which is God, a God in a, uh, what's known as a, as a theophany, he has a battle, and uh, he obviously loses the battle, and is, it has his name changed, uh, and the, uh, uh, the name is Israel, which is the name he'll be given, is contends with God, which is still not a particularly good title to have, really, if you think about it. He deceives to, he contends with God, he battles with God. But of course, that is, in one sense, his whole task. He will then become the father of the nations of, uh, of Israel, and Israel will become the race which learns the lessons from God throughout the whole of the Old Testament, and then gives birth to the Messiah for the benefit of everybody. I don't know if you remember the words that were actually said to Jacob as, as he, uh, first of all, he sees his vision. The vision is of a connection between earth and heaven, a ladder on which the angels are going up with the questions and the prayers of the people of God and coming back down with the answers of God. And it's a picture of the link between earth and heaven and the grace of love. And God is blessing from above. But I hope you notice how Jesus changed the image 
He immediately says, you will see the angels, all the problems, the prayers going up from the earth, and uh, ascending and descending, bringing back all the blessings and answers on the Son of Man. The ladder between heaven and earth is Jesus himself. And of course that immediately feeds back to what, uh, uh, to what um, uh, Jesus had said uh, to, to, to him. Not only is, it, is he an Israelite without deceit, without a Jacob in him, but also, of course, uh, that you will see this greater thing, because I am, as you have correctly discerned, the Son of God and the King of Israel. So in this passage, what we found is this wonderful promise that the Son of God, the King of Israel, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, by human terms, will bring about the great blessing that was promised in Genesis chapter 28, when he said, uh, I will, through you, in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth, all the families of the earth be blessed. This, from the very beginning, was God's plan. It finds its fulfillment in Jesus fully, completely, and absolutely. What we find in our passage is the priority of Jesus, that he reaches out to us first, even if it's through other people. He is always taking the prior action. Prejudice, which often means we can't hear what God is saying to us. The very person of Jesus at the heart of everything we see and say. He's the one who transforms us. He's the one who loves us. And then the promise that all the families of earth shall be blessed through this one and only ladder to heaven. The true Son of Man, the King of Israel, the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth. May you find in him that rich blessing in all that you do. Thank you so much, Simon, for unpacking those passages for us. If you'd like to stand at home, you're very welcome, but we're going to now affirm our faith in the words of the Creed. So I invite those in church to stand, and if you're at home, you're very welcome to stand if you'd like to do that too. But let's affirm our faith together. Let us declare our faith in God. We believe in one God. The Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and great, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance to the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of he will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please do be seated as we come now to a time of prayer. So we begin with the words of our collect this morning. Enable us, Lord Jesus, to follow in your example of love, so we are driven by your compassion. All we do. 
Help us to recognize and deal with any attitudes and ways of thinking that make it difficult for us to show such love to others. Amen. This morning we come now to that Jesus who says, follow me. We come now seeking his blessing on this world and on ourselves. So let's pray to the Father through Jesus the Son, in the power of the Holy Spirit, seeking the blessing of God for ourselves, the church, and the world. Heavenly Father, this morning we seek your blessing on our world, so broken, so in need of your love. We pray especially for all those who are struggling as the lockdown continues to put stress and strain on all of us. Pray particularly this morning for those who find themselves struggling with their mental health in this time of isolation. Bring your blessing, Lord. Would they know your companionship, your walking with them, and would they hear the call to follow you, knowing that that will bring life and blessing. We pray too, Lord, for the continuing rollout of the vaccine across our nation. Would you bless that endeavor? Would you work with the government, give wisdom to all those who must make decisions? We pray for a speedy and uh, efficient rollout of that vaccine. But we also pray beyond that for vision beyond this time, that our government would look beyond the challenges of the pandemic and seek to build a better world in its aftermath. Lord, in your mercy, you hear our prayer. We pray for your church, that gathering of people who have chosen to follow you, who have heard your command and responded. Lord, we thank you that you promise to be with us always, even to the end of the age, that by your Spirit you dwell with each of us. We thank you, Lord, that in these times of lockdown we are separated physically but never spiritually, that you bind us in unity by that same Spirit, that you draw us close to one another and above all close to you. Would you pour out your blessing on your church, Lord? Would we encounter you in word, in communion, in fellowship? And by encountering you, would we be blessed and be a blessing to the whole world? We pray to you, Lord, for the many people of our parish who do not yet know you, who have not yet heard that call and responded. Help us to be faithful witnesses but help us above all simply to ask you to go before us, to prepare the way by your Spirit. Would you encounter people where they are, Lord, and say to them, follow me, and help us to be a community of joy, a community that revels in following you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for the town of Blackpool, for all the different parts that make up our parish, for Leighton, for Staining, and for Grange Park. Lord, would you bring your blessing to each of those communities? We recognize that so many are concerned with loss of income and employment. Lord, would you open the storehouses of heaven by your Son, Jesus, and bring blessing to each of those communities? Lord, help us to be faithful in blessing all the world, including the places where you have put us. Help us to be faithful in serving in however, in whatever way we can, in the environments that you have put us. And would we see transformation, the kind of transformation that only encounter with you can bring? Would we see many lives transformed by meeting with you and knowing that you are truly the Son of God? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those who know to us this morning who are particularly in need of your blessing. We pray for Jeff and Suzanne, for Dorothy Archer, for Susan Seinhoffen, for Alison Cross, for Jennifer Cross and all of that family, for Frank Hall and for Barbara Wall. Lord, we know you are the source of all blessing. Would you draw near to each of these people we have named, and anyone else particularly on our hearts this morning. Bring them comfort and healing and peace. We pray 
too prepare for the family and friends of those recently bereaved. We pray especially for the family and friends of Jenny Dilley's sister and for Janet and Morris and Van Burn. Lord, we know that with you lie the words of eternal life, that you long to draw us all to yourself in the heavenly place where you have gone before us. Bring comfort and peace to all those who mourn and help us to live knowing the promise of eternal life that you offer to all who love you and follow you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And this morning, Lord, as we gather for communion, not physically, but still, nevertheless, united in that spirit that you have poured out to us, would we this morning say yes to that call to follow Jesus? And would we meet with him and be transformed? as we recognize in him the Son of God. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'd like to at home, uh, that's great. Please stand, uh, and I'm going to invite everybody here uh, to stand as well as we come to sharing that peace that uh, we've uh, been talking about, that way that we can uh, have peace with our Father in heaven through all that Jesus has done for us. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. We just pause and uh, share that peace. Please be seated for those of you here. And uh, just a, a special thank you during uh, this service, special thank you to Andrew and Sarah who, uh, who have uh, produced the songs for us uh, that we've been, uh, or the one we've enjoyed and uh, the other two still to come. As we come to this time of sharing communion, let's just pause and uh, think of those, uh, you know, this is a, a, a remembrance of all that Jesus has done. It's a looking forward to him coming again in glory and uh, thinking about uh, our part in the body of Christ and a time for each of us to reflect on where we are in that journey. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his once and for all offering of himself a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, he instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray and grant that we, receiving these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood who, on the same night that he was betrayed, took bread, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, 
This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. We can say the Lord's Prayer. us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever.
So we say our prayer after communion together. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give life to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to listen to a final hymn now, At the Name of Jesus, Every Knee Shall Pray. Peace of God, who passes, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Thank you for
joining us uh, this morning, and uh, and we're uh, we're obviously streaming 10 o'clock each day. Please do tune in, and uh, if you need anything, please let us know. If you'd like a DVD of the services again, just leave a message on the church uh, 